All right, how's everybody doing today? Hotep, hey, this is Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show, a talk show host, researcher, lecturer, and writer. So it is uh, Tuesday, May 14th, 2019, and it's time to talk uh, financial planning. It's time to deal with uh, talk investing. And for that conversation, I'm joined by certified financial planner, Marticia Patterson. How you doing today, Marticia? I'm good. How are you? Oh, I'm all right. It's a hectic day, but I'm doing okay. So uh, we're going to discuss um, dispelling myths about financial planning. We'll, we'll deal with here's why financial planning is so important for the African American community. Okay, here's why financial planning is so important. So important for the African American community. We hear reports about the stock market continuing to hit records. We know that doesn't trickle down to everybody, however. Mm -hmm. But um, financial planning, financial strategies are extremely important. So, Marticia, explain to people uh, first of all your background when it mm -hmm. comes to financial planning and your credentials. Sure. So my background includes um, being in the financial services industry for the last 20 years. So I've been in the financial services industry for the last 20 years. And um, about five years ago, I decided to pursue my certified financial planning designation to make sure that I was credentialized. So basically, you know, if you see a doctor or you see a, a CFP, when you see those credentials, you pretty much know that that person has um, taken coursework, they've gotten the experience, and they've pretty much secured their experience level in a certain field. So the CFP designation basically says that the person has completed certain coursework, um, there's an exam, and that we have um, completed certain continuing education courses so that when people work with us, they understand the level of expertise and the ethical requirements that we're required to uphold. So the Certified Financial Planner designation just credentializes someone's experience when it comes to the profession of financial planning. Okay. All right. Excellent. So uh, explain to uh, the audience why financial planning is so important for African Americans. And the reason why I say that is because, you know, when I watch MSNBC, and MSNBC is on right now, it's just muted. When I watch MSNBC, I see a lot of commercials dealing with wealth creation. Mm -hmm. I see commercials dealing with financial planning, planning for the future, planning for your child to go to college. And then when I look at, say, uh, TV one or <laughs> look at BT or something like that. I, I, I tend to see more commercials dealing with payday loan places and mm -hmm. cash checking, cash advance, et cetera, mm -hmm. uh, and pawn shops as well. Okay, so talk to people, explain to people why uh, financial planning is so important. So, um, yeah, absolutely right, Michael. I mean, they target, you know, marketing, as you know, I know you studied this and you taught yes. it. Uh, marketing is is aimed at targeting a certain group that the people making the ads feel like those commercials will basically resonate with the most. So for whatever reason, it could be based on fact or fiction, um, the people in, in the corporate America that make these commercials feel like payday loans and, um, you know, uh, ways to just use your credit and stuff like that will resonate more with the African African American community rather than stuff like talking about financial planning. And like I said, it could be based on fact or fiction, but my goal is to talk to people and to educate people about the importance of financial planning and to dispel the myths, as you said. So um, I would really caution people from listening to those uh, payday lending commercials because most of those strategies are very short term, right. right? So if you are in a bind and you need money, unfortunately, and it's not just the black white thing, but unfortunately, you know, the, the quickest way to deal with that is a short term solution. So if you don't have money and there's someone there offering you money that you can pay back later, you may, you may tend to go to that solution rather than try to figure out a, a long-term solution to your problem. So financial planning serves both. There's a, a short-term a short effect and a long-term effect. And I think 
if people shift to a more long-term thought process and more intentional acts, then we'll quickly see that payday loans and, and stuff like that is, is really not a solution, even in the short term, because those interest rates, as you know, and as I'm sure your audience knows, are really close to criminal. And right. it, it puts you in a cycle of repaying loans, repaying loans, and you never really get ahead. And then you don't know how you ended up in that situation. So financial planning is important for everyone. And I really want to take some time to explain what it is and what it's not. Okay. So, so explain what is financial planning and what is not financial planning. So first I start with what it's not. So financial planning is not one dimensional, right? Okay. Financial planning is a very comprehensive process and it addresses a multitude of things. So a lot of people think that financial planning is budgeting. Some people think that it's investing. Mm-hmm. But if financial planning is really looking at your whole financial situation and creating a plan that connects the dots to make sure that you are able to do what it is you want to do. So if you want to pay for college for your child or for yourself, if you want to invest for retirement, if you want to save money for a vacation, if you want to make sure that you don't owe the IRS on April 15th, right. all of those things come to play when you are developing a financial plan. And a financial plan is unique to everyone, right? Because we all have unique situations. What may work for me may not work for you, Michael, or someone else in your audience. Right. So for me, what I want to do is make sure that I break down, there's about seven components to a financial plan, and they're in no order, right? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say what they are, but they don't okay. necessarily have to go in an order. And I just want to emphasize that it is not a one-dimensional thing. If you have your budget in place, that doesn't mean you have a financial plan. If you have investment accounts, if you have a stockpile account, account, that doesn't mean that you have a financial plan. That just means that you're in one part of the plan. So um, when you think about a financial plan, of course, you think about a budget, right? And a lot of people don't like budgeting, but whether or not you're doing it intentionally or not, we're all budgeting because we have money coming in regardless of its source, right? We have some right. entrepreneurs. We have some people who have a fixed income because they're retired. Maybe they're disabled. And then you have some of us, most of us, who earn an income through, through an employer. But we all have money coming in and we all have money going out. So whether or not you're paying attention to those numbers, we all are budgeting. And the budget is a cornerstone of building a financial plan. Okay. Yeah. So the other, thing that, the other thing that we look at is um, income tax planning. Okay. Um, the tax laws are ever changing and it's all based on the law, right? It's, anything can change, just like we just saw last year. With right. Tax cuts and Job Act went into play. A lot of us saw big changes in our tax return. So mm-hmm. tax planning is another part of a financial plan because you want to make sure, regardless of what the laws are, that you're taking advantage of every credit and every deduction that you're due. And that stuff changes based on your circumstances. So if you have a child, you may be eligible for different credits and deductions. Or if your child turns a certain age, you may not be eligible for those things. So part of your financial plan, and we file taxes every year, some of us file taxes every quarter, or we pay taxes every quarter, um, you want to make sure that you're taking advantage of whatever credits or deductions that you can. So income tax planning is another part. Um, something else that we like to look at is insurance. Now, a lot of people, okay. insurance, because for instance, if you own property that has debt on it, insurance is required. So if you have a mortgage, you have to have insurance. If you have a car with a car note, you have to have insurance. Um, we all are aware of life insurance, disability insurance. So what insurance does, and some people may not look at it like this, but what insurance does is it actually protects your wealth. It protects your wealth and it protects your income. So disability insurance, if it protects your income because of some, we're more likely to be disabled than, than to die early, to be quite. Okay. Most right. people are disabled than they will to die, die early. So disability insurance protects your income. Of course, property insurance protects property and life insurance protects your family. So you wanna make sure that you have the right insurance in place and the right levels of insurance. So that's part of your financial plan. Another part is retirement investing. Most of us have something that we can access through work. All of us can open up an IRA, whether it's Roth or traditional. 
And some business owners can open different types of IRAs to allow them to invest more. But the point is, we all have access to some form of retirement investing, and we should all be looking into that and investing in ourselves for the future. Um, another thing that we look at is um, education funding for okay. ourselves or for our kids. Most people right. are aware of a 529 plan, right. which is basically a special account with special tax privileges that you can save for to pay for college or trade school or whatever. And then we have um, estate planning. And a lot of people don't think that pertains to them because the word estate kind of denotes wealth. Right. But I do have a few current event stories that I would talk to, talk about when okay. you know when we get to that part to indicate how important estate planning really is for all of us. Okay. So those are the basic components of a financial plan, and they don't work independent of each other. They really work together. And the whole point of a financial plan is to make sure that whatever you're getting in is being utilized in the best way so that you meet whatever goals that are at hand. And that whatever's going out is something that you planned for, something that you anticipated. Okay, excellent. All right, so uh, I know you talked about uh, education and and a five twenty nine plan, and um, I know that uh, I, I I know here in Michigan they have one plan where you can invest, and it is good for any college in the state of Michigan. You have other college, you have other plans where. It's uh, any basically any college in the U.S. It's not just uh, restricted to a particular state. Mm-hmm. And with yep. the the growing cost of college tuition <laughs> every year, <laughs> I yeah. mean, this is something I think extremely important. Okay, so you have a couple of current event articles dealing with uh, states and the state planning. Yes, yes. Okay. So okay. I actually have three, and and okay. and one of them is just to highlight how us in the African-American community think versus what other communities may think. And this is not to generalize, this is just an example. Mm -hmm. So everybody knows that Luke Perry, the guy from 90210, um, passed away recently. Mm -hmm. And it was well reported that um, after a health scare prior to the stroke that caused his death, um, he made it a point to get his estate plan in place. So he had a will, he has some trust and anything in a trust is not public information. So if okay. you have a trust set up and you decide whomever is going to be the beneficiary, that's not public information. But if you have a will that has to go through probate court and that becomes public information. So he had a will and trust and what was in the will is what's public, right? So my point is he did an estate plan. He had someone named, to make decisions about his life when he became incapacitated. So when he was in a stroke and he was incapacitated, there was someone, he already made a decision when he was well uh, healthy to right. say, you individual, whoever, sister, brother, mother, whoever, I want you to, for lack of a better term, pull the plug. If the doctors say, you know, he's not going, going to come back. So that when that situation happened, there was no fighting. There was no, no courts involved because that decision was made when he was healthy, right? Okay. Now, let's move on to um, John Singleton. Right. Now, everybody knows John Singleton also suffered a stroke. He was also young. He was only 51. Right. And the way the story is reported, he, was, he suffered from high blood pressure for quite some time. And in some of the reports I read, he suffered silently. Now, I don't know if that means that he wasn't getting the medical attention he should, like, you know, taking medication. But the point is, he was traveling overseas. He came back because he was complaining of weakness in his legs. And he went to the hospital in California, where he was from, and I believe born and raised. And um, that's where he suffered the massive stroke. So in his situation, Um, In order to make those critical medical decisions on his behalf, his mom had to go to court. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, you know, I'm not there. But to me, if you have to go to court to file for guardianship or conservatorship, that means there was no one named in an advanced medical directive. And an advanced medical directive is one 
of the estate planning documents that we as financial planners suggest everybody has in place. Because had he had that in place, his mom would not have to go to court in the middle of him being in a coma in the hospital. And also yeah. his, his daughter was actually fighting his mother's request to be uh, responsible for not only his finances, but the decision to take him off for of life support because the daughter felt like his, his uh, John Singleton's father or her brother would have been a better choice. But unfortunately, the daughter doesn't have a say. The courts make the decision and the courts decided that his mother would be in charge of those decisions. So, so that's all part of the state planning. Yes. So the state planning documents are, everyone knows the will, right? Mm -hmm. you, you set up a will, you decide who's going to receive your assets, um, assets, any asset. I mean, you can will anything that you own. Um, of course, money, property, uh, jewelry, art, anything you have, you can right. put it in the will. One of the main things a will does is if you have minor children, that is where you name the guardians. Okay. Because, you know, right. otherwise the courts will. Right. Um, when you die without a will, it's called intestate. And intestate laws vary from state to state and dependent on the residency of you, that whatever state you were a resident of when you died, not the state you died in, but the state you were a resident of, those laws would dictate everything. So you need to have a will. Um, a power of attorney is another document in your estate plan. And yeah. that basically gives someone the right to act for you while you're alive, right? So it could be um, a specific, right. right? It could be specific. Like you can give, a, you may not realize it, but when you um, buy or sell property, there are documents that you sign in your attorney's office that give them certain power of attorney rights. They're very limited, specific to that real estate transaction. But if you really look at the documents, you're giving them power of attorney to act on your behalf, sign certain documents. Um, then there's a general durable power of attorney that allows someone to act on anything as, as if they're you. So okay. you wanna put that in place. That power actually goes away when the person dies. So my husband is my power of attorney. Mm -hmm. But when I pass away, he can't act on my behalf. He would have to be named as the executor in my will. So power of attorney is only valid during the person's life. And then you have a health care proxy, someone to act on your behalf if you're incapacitated. Right. And then, um, so those are the basic documents in an estate plan. Um, so John Singleton's plan was lacking. and. Um, who else was it? Uh, Nipsey, Nipsey Hussle. Yeah, Nipsey Hussle. Right. Um, from what we what was reported, he had trust in place. So apparently, yes. you know, some of these celebrities were setting up GoFundMe pages for his family, good intentions, but his family came out and said, "No need." You know, Nipsey right. took care of his family, which is awesome. So that tells us that he had some type of estate plan in place. Um, as I said before, anything that passes through a trust is not public, so we won't know what that is. Um, he had a fiance, so she's not right. um, entitled to anything through the law, but she could have very well been a beneficiary on those trusts. Um, and also in California, um, the first in line to receive assets are the children if there's no spouse, and then after that are the parents of the deceased. So in either case, it looks like his kids will be taken care of. It sounds like he has some form of, a, of an estate plan through trust set up. And from what I can see, um, either he was in the process of starting a nonprofit foundation or he, he started one. But part of his legacy, that's what we want to think about when we're thinking about wealth, because you can't take it with you. What right. is your legacy going to be? Everybody could see that Nipsey had a legacy of community. And it looks like in his death, that legacy will be fulfilled. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah, I, I read about that as well. Uh, Lauren London, Lauren London is, is, uh, was his fiance. Mm -hmm. And um, she talked about how, um, you know, he had a trust set up. He took care of his family, things like that. So the GoFundMe uh, campaigns were not necessary. So 
Uh, you talked about the um, seven, uh, what was it, seven parts mm-hmm. of a, a financial plan, things mm-hmm. like this. Um, when we look at um, when we look at news stories about the stock market hitting records, mm-hmm. and we we hear Trump bragging about the economy. Mm-hmm. Uh, things like this, right? But then we look at other stories. I know CBS News had a story uh, from a couple of days ago. Mm-hmm. I posted on my Facebook page, which talked about um, uh, how it, it, it dealt with millennials, and it talked about how um, I think maybe one in three millennials or something like that live with their parents, how they yeah. can't afford to pay, <laughs> how they can't afford, I'm going to try to pull this article up, how they can't afford, can't afford to pay for living expenses, et cetera. So how will financial planning help when it comes to, um, your grown children, right? Mm-hmm. Who, who are still living at home or they talk, talk, talk about that because there's a disconnect. And uh, mm-hmm. I, I'm going to pull this article up. It's from uh, May. It's from May 13th from uh, CBSNews.com. And what's the name of it here? Hold on, it's coming up. But talk mm-hmm. about that, and, I, and I'll talk about this article in just a minute. Well, I mean, I have uh, two children in the Z or whatever, the next generation after millennial, right? So mm-hmm. for me, it's important to talk to them about money and. Uh, the reality of the fact that, you know, things, it's not the same as even when I was growing up or, you know, my mother, my father, things are different, you know, but at the same time, they're the same. Because as much as we want to say, you know, things weren't as expensive back then, people weren't making as much as we can make now. Mm -hmm. So the, the ratios have changed, but we still have the same problems. And what I can say for sure is, if we talk to our children about money, um, I know we in our community, we have a grown folk conversation type mentality. Um, we shouldn't talk to our kids shouldn't be part of certain conversations. And I get that. Um, I was raised in a black household by a, my grandmother, <laughs> old school. I get it. Right. But there was a lot of things that I didn't get um, the advantage of learning because of those type of um, ways of bringing kids up. You know, my experience with money in my family was not as open as I do with my kids today. Now, my kids are not running anything. They're still the kids. But, you know, they're old enough to have jobs. Um, My daughter is 20 and she um, she goes to school. She's finishing her sophomore year and she has a job and I teach her to do a budget. I don't dictate her budget to her because she's the one that has to live on it. But I do talk to her about planning to spend for lunch. She likes to eat out. She likes to to have her lunch. So I do talk to her and say, listen, you know, what are you going to spend this week? You have to plan for transportation. You have to plan for this, that, whatever. So we talk about money. You know, she plans her budget. She knows what she's going to spend. Um, We talk about the student loans that she's taken out. Um, okay. we, we, my husband and I plan to minimize those loans. I mean, she has to take out something, but we do, um, plan to cash flow a lot of it so that she's not saddled with student loans when she graduates to a degree right. that it cripples her and she can't move out, you know, she's ended up with us after college, <laughs> Right. you know, so I, I can't say that there's a magic bullet, but what I can say is, um, I find personally that when we make intentional decisions, when we plan how we're gonna spend our money before we get it, um, as opposed to trying to figure out where it went after we spent it, I think that makes a huge difference. And um, I try to educate my kids with that and I just try to set them up so that when they start making that little bit of money at these little jobs, um, those habits form and by the time they're in their careers, those habits kind of support them in their lives when they get out on their own. Okay. Uh, so if, if we look at this article from cbsnews.com, uh, it's entitled, A Decade After the Recession, 40% of U.S. Families Still Struggling. 
a decade after the recession, 40% of U.S. families still struggling. This is from May 13, mm -hmm. 2019. And it says 40% uh, of U.S. families, including middle class households, mm -hmm. sometimes struggle to afford housing, utilities, food, or health care, according to the Urban Institute. Nearly one in five families said they had expressed difficulty paying for food or medical care. Mm -hmm. And about 60% of low income people surveyed by the nonpartisan think tank uh, say they could not pay their bills at times, okay? Uh, and then it goes on to say four in 10 Americans sometimes face what economists call material hardship, mm -hmm. struggling to pay for basic needs such as food and housing, according to a new stu study from the uh, Urban Institute. Even middle class families routinely struggling financially and are even middle class families routinely struggle financially and are occasionally unable to pay their bills. So uh, we'll post a link here on the third of the broadcast so people can check this out. So how does um, uh, for maybe those that just tuned in, uh, how does financial planning help people in those dire uh, in those situations like this, and we're talking, about, we're talking about also middle class families, mm -hmm. all right. And, and this is and this is something that you know a lot of when we look at the uh, 2020 campaign, a lot of Democratic candidates are saying, "Wait, hold on, a lot of people are not feeling this great economy that Trump is talking oh, about, yeah. keeps bragging about." Okay, yeah. okay, go yeah, ahead. The economy, you know, that is it, the problem with those type of comments is that we know there's two different worlds as far mm -hmm. as the economic status of this country, right? So you can talk about the stock market, um, but most of us only feel that if we have a retirement account and our main source of investing um, is a retirement account. So the stock market going up and down, you know, they just announced the um, IPO of Uber um, and Lyft came out last week. And I, you know, we could talk about that a little bit as well, but um, this economy is a tough one. You know, um, it's been, and I think every generation has had um, an economy that they've had to survive through. Um, but I still believe that, um, I'll give you an example. Okay. Um, I had a client I was working with who um, was experiencing a lot of the things that you mentioned just now. Mm -hmm. And after we talked and we really had a, just a real, real conversation about the situation, I think her first breakthrough was acknowledging um, some of the decisions that she made, which kind of led to her situation. Now, I'm not blaming. I don't want anyone to think that I'm going to sit here and blame people for their situation. Mm -hmm. But there's a level of accountability that I think if we all just sat down quietly to ourselves, we could admit to. Um, and in her situation, there was a level of accountability that she owned up to. And she, you know, in working together, um, she was able to pay off credit cards that she couldn't pay off. She couldn't seem to pay off before. Um, right. I identified some language that she used, which affects your mindset. Like we have to understand everything is tied together, right? So if you have a certain mindset or you use certain language to describe your situation, it can actually manifest. And I'm not trying to be, you know, some type of psychic or any, any crazy stuff like that, but it's true. You know, like she, right. she would say stuff to me like, you know, I don't understand why I'm always broke. Well, what are you doing with your money? You know, like, let's really break this thing down, you know? And she would say things like, you know, I took out a payday loan <laughs> and I can't seem to pay them off. Right. And then when we talked about it, she paid them off, but then she would sign up for their offer to renew them all the time. Mm. So I just said, stop doing that. Pay them off and never renew them again. And when right. you get your paycheck, let's look at your paycheck. So we looked at her paycheck and we deducted things in priority. So what's priority? Housing, food, uh, transportation, utilities, right? You prioritize the things that you need to make sure you pay. And when she did that, she had mathematically a balance at the end of the month. Okay, she had money left over. She had money left over, but she really said, I never, I don't have anything. So just by, I don't, I'm not living her life, right? I don't know exactly what she's doing, but I can tell you by math, you have enough to cover all your expenses and extra. Mm -hmm. So when you really just take a look at your situation, 
um, I would argue that some of it, and I'm not saying all of it, because the economy and the, the wages and a lot of stuff contribute to our situation, but some of it can be attributed to a lack of intentionality or awareness. And sometimes things are so hard that we just kind of just throw it up in the air and see where it lands. And um, I think that we, we, we do have a level of control and a level of power that we can actually um, utilize in our daily lives. And I would challenge anyone to take their paycheck and deduct their expenses on a piece of paper. And um, I, think, I think people would be surprised to see that they actually have more money than they thought they did. Right, right. Uh, let people know how they can get in contact with you. If they want more information, if they want you to become their uh, uh, personal financial planner, they want you to help them invest. How can people get in contact with you? Sure. So my website is Patterson Plans, the number 17.com. So that's P A T T E R S O N P L A N S 17.com. So that's my website, and you'll see my uh, um, services, the course, um, and you'll see some blogs. I also have a blog there where I write about different things going on, okay. so you can see my perspective on, on things. So that's my website, um, and that's the best place to get in touch with me. Absolutely. All right, so um, you talked about, earlier, you talked about the seven uh, components of a, of a financial plan. Mm -hmm. uh, just recap those seven quickly for those that tuned in late. Sure. So, um, like I mentioned before, they're not in any specific order. Mm -hmm. But the seven are um, a cash flow analysis or a budget, um, income tax planning, which is when we make sure that you get the benefit of any credits or deductions that are available to you at that particular tax year. Um, you have investing, of course. Everyone equates financial planning with investing, but it's not the same thing. Investing is a part of it, so investing. Retirement investing, uh, education planning, a risk analysis or um, an insurance review, and an estate plan. Okay, excellent. And you can help people with all seven of those. Yes, and I will say as um, with the income tax planning, of course, you have CPAs who are experts. Mm -hmm. and you also have another category called an enrolled agent. I don't know if you guys are aware of what an enrolled agent is, but that's like one level down from a CPA. Basically, an enrolled agent is um, a title that the IRS recognizes as an expert, but they haven't taken the exam to become licensed. Um, and then, of course, you have bookkeepers, you have tax preparers. Um, and I will say that the only two types of tax professionals who can represent you in tax court are enrolled agents and CPAs. Just keep that in mind. Enrolled agents and CPAs. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I'm not a tax, I'm not a tax expert, but as a financial planner, I can help you prep for your meeting with your tax preparer, things to ask for ask about things to look for just so you're an informed consumer because the last thing you want to do is show up in front of someone and just they have all the power because you don't you're not aware of what um you should be looking for and what you should expect so i can definitely right. help people with that um and i'm not a lawyer so i cannot prepare um, wills or anything like that but again i can help prepare you to sit in front of an attorney and get your estate plan in place and I think that's so important. And I think so Absolutely. many of us take that um, for granted. I mean, I, I was just talking to um, someone 51 years old, um, mm -hmm. doesn't have a will. Oh, wow. Yeah, they, they definitely need to get one. Um, and and uh, when, when you listen to our podcast of our shows, you'll hear uh, Marticia's uh, commercials running as well, because she advertises with us also. Um, so last question, there is a, I hear more and more, I see articles, I, re, I read blackenterprise.com uh, and I see articles about getting children involved in investing, teaching children about money. Mm -hmm. Okay. What are some tips that you uh, give? Well, first of all, do you, um, do you help? Do you counsel your clients on how to teach their children about money as well? Absolutely. I mean, I think that, you know, as we talked about a little earlier, that it's very important that you talk to your kids about money. You mm -hmm. talk to them about how to handle their money. I mean, listen, we have money. There's only a couple things we can do with it, right? We can spend it. 
Right. We can save it. Save it. Mm -hmm. We can invest it, which is two different things. Okay? Right. And we can give it. Give it away, right. And I promote all of that in a very strategic way, right? And with a financial plan, you can do all of those things with your money. And I promote talking to your kids about it, even with their allowance. When mm -hmm. you give them allowance, um, everybody's different. You know, like in my household, I have an allowance for my son because he's still in high school and he doesn't okay. you know, work like my daughter. My husband gives money for grades. Okay. I personally never got money for grades so i don't <laughs> give money for grades but you know my husband thinks listen if somebody worked hard and got a an, uh, hundred on a test they should get money my point is he gets money through us my daughter gets money through work and mm -hmm. we talk to both of them about what are you going to do with your money so right now my son is saving every dime because he wants to buy studio time okay he for for music for music Okay. Yep. So I'm like, mm hmm that's what you need to do because I don't Steel know. Your time can be expensive, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So that's what he's doing, you know. But it's not, you know, he also spends. It's it's you know, I won't say it's not healthy. I think that may be taking it too far, but I think it's good practice to spend money, save money, invest money, and give it away. And right. you know, for me personally, every year I give to the Trayvon Martin Foundation. Okay. I think they do good work. And um, all the money is not for me. You know, this is, this is a life we're living and what kind of legacy do we want to leave? So I help people develop financial plans so that they can experience each part of what you can do with money so that they feel fulfilled. Nobody wants to work 40, 60, 80 hours a week right. to, to throw it all in the stock market or spend it all or give it all away. There has to be balance. And that's what a financial plan does. It, it creates a space for balance in a strategic way. Okay, excellent, excellent. Well, everybody visit our website, pattersonplan17.com, pattersonplan17.com. And, uh, you know, when we look at things like, uh, I know Washington Post has a uh, article that I cite sometimes. It's from uh, March 14th, 2019, a, a new explanation for the stubborn persistence of the racial wealth gap, a mm -hmm. new explanation for the stubborn persistence of the racial wealth gap. And, you know, we have historical inequities in this country, mm -hmm. but uh, when we look at um, the, uh, the average uh, net worth as of 2016 of an African-American family, $17,100 compared to $171,000 uh, average net worth for uh, a white family, mm -hmm. right? So even though uh, there's structural inequities and we're pushing for various policies to address certain mm -hmm. issues, internally, there are things that we can do also to help fight okay. against this as well, okay? Definitely, we have to fight from both sides. We have to pay right. attention to what's going on. We have to stay involved in politics, social issues, but we also have to be accountable to what's going on within our households and in our pockets. And um, there is inequity. And I think a lot of the inequity has to do with a lack of information and the lack of knowledge. So for me, as an African-American woman, mm -hmm. the reason why I decided to become a certified financial planner is because there's a lack of representation in the field with the designation. Right. Only 4% of us are CFPs. Out of 83,000, only 4,000 are African-American. I don't know how many of those are women. So sure. out of 83,000, what? Stock a certified financial right. planner. Oh, out of 83,000 mm -hmm. certified financial planners, only 4% are African-Americans? Yes, only 4%. Okay. And I also want to make a distinction. There's a lot of different um, terms for people in this business. So okay. I'm saying I'm a certified financial planner because I am certified. I had to pass an exam. I had to take two and a half years of coursework. And I have to have continuing education, including ethics. Right. You have financial coaches. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> they, and listen, a lot of them are knowledgeable, but I just want to be right. clear. You have financial coaches. Right. You have financial advisors, and then you have financial gurus. Right. Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and you know, again, <laughs> I, you know, I'm not here to knock anyone, but I just right. I know there's alphabet soup out there when it comes to this <laughs> this business. And um, when you go to see, you know, someone for your health, you're looking for the MD. Right, right, right. <laughs> for some type of 
convince you to give you a, a level of confidence that this person understands what's going on and not only you know one time but that they're involved in the industry so that they're abrupt of any changes, anything that's coming down the pike that could affect your financial plan. And a financial plan is individual to you. When you yes. have a financial planner, you deal with that person as your life changes. So if you get married, you get divorced, you have kids, whatever right. the answers are, you, you need to someone. Right. I mean, there's a lot of information, but information is power. But application of that information is what yields results. And working with a financial plan that gets that application unique to you put in place. So I just advocate for just knowing who, if you want to work with a guru, you want to work with a, uh, a financial coach, just mm -hmm. know what you're getting when you um, work with, with the different people. And it's always your choice, obviously. Right. But right. we're not all the same. Absolutely. No, I totally understand that. All right. Well, look, Marticia, it's always good talking to you. You uh, too. No problem. So you have a good night, okay? Talk good to night. You and everybody visit Patterson Plans, the number 17.com. PattersonPlans17.com, okay? And one more thing, Michael, oh, go on Friday, May 17th, if anyone's in the New Jersey area in Essex County, I'm having a financial planning workshop. And we're going over in detail my six steps to building a strong financial plan. We're going to have a good time. We're going to chit chat and we're going to get into it. So if you're in the area, check me okay. out. My event is on Eventbrite. So that's Friday, May 17, 2019. Yeah. What, what time? It's from 7.30 p.m. to 9 o'clock. So after work. Okay. Um, um, well, some people work at night, but you know what I mean. Yeah, 7.30 and, p.m. Um, and 7.30 p.m. to 9 p.m. Yep, and it's in Montclair, New Jersey. I have an event on Eventbrite. Okay. And, and the cost is $25, mm -hmm. and it's one and a half hours of breaking down six things you can do to build a strong financial foundation. Okay, and uh, is there a link on your website to Eventbrite? Yes, if you go into my website and click okay. on the Events tab, you'll okay. see the information there as well. Okay, and on Eventbrite, what is the name of it? So if people just want to search on Eventbrite for it, what's the name of it on Eventbrite? Yep, the name is time to take action one dot eventbrite dot com. Okay, time to take action. And the number one. The number one. Okay. Yeah. And it was oh. inspired. It was the title was inspired by uh, Red Man. I was listening to some old school hip hop. Okay. <laughs> time and, to take and time for some action came on. I said, "Yep, that's the name of my workshop." <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, people check that out on Friday, uh, May 17th, 2019, 7.30 p.m. to 9 p.m. Yep. Okay, Marticia, you have a great night, okay? You too. Thank you, Michael. All right. No problem. Talk Good to night. you later. Peace. Peace out. All right. Okay, everybody. Hey, uh, be sure to listen to um, our show, the African History Network show, uh, every Sunday, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. On 9, 10 a.m. the Superstation WFDF. We broadcast here on Facebook Live. Follow us on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network. And um, we'll let you, and also click on notifications because it'll let you know when we go live as well. Okay. Um, and if you'd like this type of information, you can also donate to the African History Network, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. Um, as well. And if, uh, if you want to advertise with the African History Network, email us at customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. If you want to advertise with the African History Network, also our current promotion, get three months for the price of one. All right. So, hey, thanks for tuning in. Share this broadcast with your friends. Uh, we have to teach our uh, teach good financial habits to our children. I know you know consumerism is promoted to African Americans, and there's a reason why for that. There's a history behind that also. But we have to educate ourselves on financial strategies. And you know, when you hear me uh, do some of my presentations, and you you hear you see some of my lectures, I talk about how African history and culture gives us our foundation. It gives us our our values, our interests, and our principles, our VIPs. But that influences our economic empowerment and influences our political empowerment. So economics is not just the companies we spend our money with or the businesses we spend our money with. There's also where we invest our dollars, how we value the dollar, how we look at our dollars, okay? Our dollars are tools. And Marticia talked about how you can you spend money, you can save money, invest money, or give it away. 
but our dollars are tools also to utilize to bring certain things into existence. So we have a t we have gentrification taking place in our communities. Okay, so we can have all the marches we want about gentrification. At the end of the day, somebody's gonna have to buy this land, and if we're gonna buy the land, we're gonna need some money to buy it, right? So we we need financial strategies to be able to create that capital that we need to do the things that we're told that we need to do in all the documentaries that we see. We're told we need to buy the, the own businesses and own the grocery stores and the gas stations and buy the land and things like this. Well, it, it takes money to do that, okay? It takes money to do that. So we have to change our mindset and look at strategies to be able to create this capital to buy the land in our community, to stop gentrification. Okay. All right. So, hey, I have to get out of here. Remember, at the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of, uh, I said, can you tell me what happened in the link I sent? What link, Claude? I didn't, Claude, uh, post the link again. I didn't, I didn't see a link. Sorry, Claude. Um, so, remember, at the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world because right now it's correct wrong behavior. Uh, it's not over till we win. Wakanda forever. We'll talk to you next time. Peace.